Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cracking Addiction. My name is Thaleep Naren, and I'm joined as always by Fergal Armstrong. In the episode today, we're going to be talking about long-acting injectable buprenorphine. So Fergal, a simple question to start off with. What is a long-acting injectable buprenorphine? Well, Philippe, a long-acting injectable buprenorphine is a long-acting injectable buprenorphine. It is what it's, it does what it says on the tin. So it's a way of, basically, it's a way of delivering buprenorphine for opioid replacement therapy in a subcutaneous gel that allows for the delivery of buprenorphine into the systemic circulation over a prolonged period of time in contradistinction to the delivery of buprenorphine sublingually with sublingual buprenorphine. Fair enough. And I guess the name does explain what it does and how it works. So expanding upon this topic, what are the different formulations of long-acting injectable buprenorphine? Yeah, so currently there are two available uh, long-acting injectable buprenorphine products, and we call them LAIB, so long-acting injectable buprenorphine. So there's two LAIBs. One is made by Indivior, and that's called Sublocade. And the other one is made by uh, Camerus, and that is called Buvidel. Now, in the quest for generic prescribing, there is a great push to actually uh, refer to names of medications according to the generic names rather than their trade names. But in the context of LAIB, it's really important to retain these names, i.e. Sublocade and Buvidal, because the, the, the dosing, the kinetics uh, are different. So yes, they both contain buprenorphine, which is the active ingredient, hence the term long-acting injectable buprenorphine. But the way they deliver the drug, the excipients are different. So that means that the kinetics are different and the dosing is different. So can you go into a bit more detail about the differences between these two formulations of LAIBs, Virgil? So if we look at Buvidal, Buvidal's got two products. There's the monthly product and the weekly product. And the weekly product has got an 8 milligram dose, a 16 milligram dose, a 24 milligram dose, and a 32 milligram dose. The monthly products are available in doses of 64 milligrams, 96 milligrams, 128 milligrams, and 160 milligrams, although the 160 milligrams uh, is not yet available on PBS funding. It is available in Australia, but it's not PBS funded. So that's um, Buvidal. So remember, weekly doses of Buvidal last weekly, monthly doses of Buvidal last monthly. So the sublocate dosing, there's only two doses. There's the 300 milligram dose and the 100 milligram dose, and they both last a month. And the, the, the standard schedule for sublocate is that everyone should receive at least two loading doses with 300 milligrams of sublocate and then be maintained on 100 milligram dosing. So it's a very simple dosing. Um, and that dosing is applicable for, for most patients. Whereas the, uh, the dosing for Buvidal can be weekly or monthly and, and can vary between low weekly doses to high weekly doses and low monthly doses to high monthly doses. So with Buvidal, you've got a, a greater range and a greater flexibility. With Sublocade, you've got a, a kind of a uniform standard dosing regime. Excellent. So for the prescriber and the clinician, we have two different options to choose from. We've got the Buvidal, we've got the Sublocade, we've got the uh, complexity with Buvidal in that we can choose between a weekly preparation or a monthly preparation, whereas with Sublocade, it is uh, by default a monthly preparation, albeit two different strengths. So how would a prescriber go between choosing between the two different formulations of LAIBs? What would guide someone in their choices? So to really answer that question, you have to have a good knowledge of the kinetics of both pro types of products. But on a very simple level, if a patient is not sure of whether or not they want to embark upon a prolonged journey of injections every month and thereby losing the potential connection between the patient and services, you could try, you could try them on a weekly product. So Buvidal weekly would be the choice for them. If a patient really wanted to enjoy the benefits of, of, of loosening that connection between him or her and the service, 
and they were absolutely f stable on uh, sublingual buprenorphine and they and they didn't need intensive supervision well then you could possibly then think about going on to sublocate because we know that the half-life of sublocate is longer than the half-life of buvidal so the buvidal monthly half-life is about 19 to 20 25 days and the half-life of sublocate both products in fact is uh, 43 to 60 days. So for some people, once they're stabilized on a state and they've reached a steady state on the injections, for some people, those who are treated with supplicate will have a duration of action of up to two months. For some people, it'll be less, but, but you know, it is possible for some people to enjoy two months, two monthly injections and still maintain control of their opioid use disorder. And so they might benefit from that type of regime and they could just get on with their lives every two months. So really it depends on the patient and it depends on an understanding of the, of the kinetics. That's great information, Fergal. And the LIIB has really been a game changer for those of us involved in prescribing opioid replacement therapy for patients because one of the biggest bugbears of patients is the fact that they are chained to the pharmacy and that their lives revolve around going to the pharmacy to getting a dose versus LAIB can be uh, administered in a general practice setting and it is a monthly injection uh, if you choose the Bouvidal monthly version or Sublocade. And it really does free the patient up from the stigma associated with supervised dosing in a pharmacy. And we're talking about people who are used to being judged and treated poorly. And when you're going to the pharmacy to be observed to take your dose of medication, it is further stigmatizing. So LIIB, in my practice anyway, has been a great game changer for patients. And it really does give a lot of patients a, a significant amount of dignity back. Would you, would you yeah. agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, if we think about the impact of LAIB, it, it, it's transformed the way that services deliver uh, pharmacotherapy for services to patients. So if we look at the benefits, then we look at some of the potential harms. But the main, the main benefit for me is it takes away the aggro about the discussion about takeaway dosing. You, you, you know, there are no issues around takeaway. So therefore, you can spend your time more therapeutically engaged in motivational interviewing and supporting patients deal with all of the other demons in their lives that, are, that, that, that basically have taken a, a back seat during previous discussions about takeaway dosing. So you, you can engage in more therapy effectively. It frees up time. Um, however, for some people, it can be destabilizing. So people, in my experience, who have experienced significant trauma. Now, when I said that in another forum, I said, you know, I was asked, you know, which patients don't necessarily do well with LAIB. And I said, you know, patients who are the victims of trauma. And then someone in the audience said to me, well, aren't all our patients victims of trauma? Well, they are, but there is a range. So people who are on the high range of having experienced significant trauma may need ongoing intensive close supervision and may need intensive engagement with services. And if you give them an LAIB injection and say to them, well, there you are, I'll see you in a month's time, that can be completely and utterly destabilizing. So it's not necessarily a carte blanche to um, basically reduce your, your supervision of patients. In fact, for some patients, they may need more supervision. For some patients also, buprenorphine may not just be the right uh, drug for them. Because remember, yes, we're talking about how LAIB has transformed pharmacotherapy, but we must bear in mind that the key ingredient is still buprenorphine. And, and buprenorphine, in contradistinction to all of the other full mu opioid agonists, including methadone, buprenorphine is only a partial agonist, is more activating and gives this agitated, wired feeling for some people. So if you're giving them an injection of... Um, of a long-acting injectable buprenorphine. And remember, with all of these injections, they basically have a peak at about 24 hours or, or in the case of Bruvidal, monthly six hours, and then they, the levels descend. You're exposing them to that peak of feeling absolutely awful with, with agitation and feeling wired. So again, it's all about patient selection. You, patients have to be able to cope or, 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 or should be able to cope with a, little, a, a reduction in their mind of supervision but they also need to be able to cope with the potential side effects of uh, buprenorphine. I call them overdose effects, but the, you know, I'm not talking about the traditional uh, signs of opioid overdose, which includes sedation, respiratory depression, and uh, coma, and that kind of thing. 
I'm talking about the side effects per se of buprenorphine it, when they're taken in, when it's taken in too much of an amount. So again, the key thing is patient selection, and in fact, the one of the other issues is is do you check liver function tests? So you're giving some uh, you're giving a drug that has the potential to um, cause hepatotoxicity. You're, and you're giving it to a patient population that has a predisposition to hepatotoxicity because of comorbidities. Do you or do you not check LFTs beforehand? Now, in some of the product information, it recommends you do, but not all of the product information. So those are the benefits. Those are the harms. But if we look at the impact of uh, in, in total on pharmacotherapy, we, we need to understand that basically long-acting injectable buprenorphine provides for a prolonged and sustained elevation of plasma buprenorphine. And we know from uh, work done in the States that really, it, I, I think of this as one, two, three. We know that to prevent frank opioid withdrawal symptoms, we need at least a, a plasma concentration of one nanogram per mil, per, uh, per mil of buprenorphine. And we know that to prevent euphoria from other opioids and also to prevent craving, we need at least two to three nanograms um, we need two to three nanograms per mil of buprenorphine. So at steady state, we know that both of these LIIB products will achieve the, those, those levels. But it takes a while to actually achieve those. And so during the time of the long titration, and, and remember steady state can take up to four injections or five injections in any individual, it does require you to be cognizant of the fact that patients may be either relatively underdosed or overdosed depending on their previous exposure to sublingual buprenorphine. Absolutely. And as with anything, it's important to know the benefits of the medication, know the side effects of the medication, and know that no one form of medication is for everyone. As you've mentioned yeah. before, and as we've mentioned in multiple episodes before, one has to select the right intervention for the right patient. And although Buvidal and Sublocade are freeing in many aspects, that freedom is sometimes, as you mentioned, destabilizing for patients. Some patients enjoy the community feel of seeing their pharmacist, of being reviewed by their GP every few weeks, of mm -hmm. having that linkage to support services. And as we know with substance use disorder and opioid use disorder, it's not just the uh, physical dependence that we're treating, it's the whole disease process, which is much more than just the drug interaction. So as you mentioned, yeah. Fergal, it is so important to have that holistic outlook, even when using LAIBs, which have been a game changer, but as with anything, do have their limitations. And I guess, Fergal, a quick question as well to, to talk about LAIBs and commenting them. Usually the pharmaceutical companies advise commencing people on Suboxone as an induction agent, usually seven to eight days of stabilization on Suboxone before commencing LAIBs. Is that your practice as well? And is that your preference also? So I think we need to, first of all, establish what the recommendations are in terms of product information for both of these LAIB products. And then we can start talking about how one can deviate from that. So if we look at Buvidal firstly, yes, we know that Buvidal, it is recommended that uh, people get initiated onto uh, sublingual buprenorphine for a week. And then depending on the dose they're comfortable with, uh, then there is a, there is a table of equivalencies onto the weekly dose and then the monthly dose. And you literally just follow that table. It's very easy. But Buvidal also can be directly inducted. And so in the product information, it suggests that if you're coming, if you're switching from methadone, if you can get to methadone uh, at a dose of less than 30 milligrams, what you can do is simply avoid one day of method, methadone. So do without methadone dosing for one day and then start on a weekly product, uh, perhaps at uh, 24 milligrams, and then basically use eight milligram top-ups over the week, at least a day apart until you get to the maximum weekly dose of, of 32. So actually, if you were on 24, you could only get another eight. But if you were on 16 milligrams, then you can maybe take two or th two doses of eight milligrams in addition. And that would be in the first week. And then in the second week, you'd use, you'd use the, the cumulative dose of the previous week. So if you'd reached 32 in the first week, then your next weekly dose would be 32. 
And then once you're stable on the weekly product, then you can transition onto the monthly product. And again, it all boils down to having that dosing chart pinned up on your wall. The, uh, the induction onto Sublocade similarly rec suggests or recommends that there's a week of Sublocade at eight milligrams a day. As those have been the recommended recommendations elsewhere, but I don't think there's a specific dose recommended in, in the product information in, a, in, a, in Australia. But basically, stabilize for a for a week on whatever buprenorphine dose you want, and then start on Sublocade 300 for one month, and then repeat it for another month, and then drop down to 100 milligrams for maintenance thereafter. So you can see that there is, there is a, a, a very narrow dose range for practically everyone with Sublocate, whereas there's a, there's a lot of finesse in the dosing abilities with Buvidal. And again, different approaches suit different clinicians and different approaches suit different patients. There's, there's no one product that we can say is better for everyone. It's all about developing the confidence in both products and then suiting your dosing regime to the patient in front of you. Absolutely. Now, I said I said that we talk about deviations um, after we talked about the product uh, information. So there is a great vogue in minimizing the uh, time needed for sublingual buprenorphine administration. And so, in the case of sublocade, there are there is uh, there is evidence that actually the bridging dose can be brought down to maybe three or four days, even two to three days, and and the. Um, the product information now for Buvidal does validate the use of direct induction onto uh, weekly Buvidal and, it, and it including transitioning from low dose methadone. But people have developed a very uh, complicated, but nonetheless efficacious uh, regimes whereby the patients can be transferred from various doses of high or high doses of full mu agonists onto. Um, buprenorphine or sublocate whilst using uh, topical buprenorphine patches followed then by um, low doses of sublingual buprenorphine then gradually increasing the dose of sublingual buprenorphine and at the same time tapering down the dose of the other full mu agonist. Those are collectively known as variations of the Bernese method and I think are beyond the scope of this chat but we can, we can uh, discuss it in future uh, episodes. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of information about long-acting injectable buprenorphine, and this will not be the only episode we have on this topic. But I think we've talked about a lot in this episode, and we'll talk about long-acting injectable buprenorphine and buprenorphine in further episodes of Cracking Addiction. But yet again, we've had another great episode of Cracking Addiction. Thank you, Fergal, for sharing your knowledge with us, and to our listeners and viewers, bye for now.